met her in the fall. He took her to a movie, and when they done it all, he took her to a movie. Hello and welcome to this special edition of the Fabulous Picture Show. I'm Amanda Palmer. Now for the first ever Doha Tribeca Film Festival, which was held here at the stunning Museum of Islamic Art, we were looking for the perfect film and filmmaker to provide great entertainment for our opening night, but also to embody the spirit of our festival. We found that in Mira Naya and her latest film, Amelia. After this round the world flight, Miss Earhart, are you gonna give up long distance flying? Not while there's still life left in me. Always ready for a new adventure. <laughs> In this program, we'll be taking a closer look at Amelia and sharing our festival masterclass with Mira Naya, one of the most successful female directors of our time. Assalamu alaikum, Doha. Oh, I'm so happy to be here today for the Middle Eastern premiere of Amelia. Miss Amelia Earhart. Why do you want to fly? I want to be free. It's no surprise that Mira Nye is attracted to fearless females like Amelia Earhart. I'm going to fly around the world. It can be done. Well, let's change that. Like the aviator who disappeared attempting to fly around the world. There's more to life than being a passenger. Naya has defied skeptics to build a career spanning Hollywood, India, and independent cinema. We both came from tiny, small towns. We both had incredibly big appetites for the world, much beyond this, uh, where we came from. And I always knew that, uh, that I would see this world. And I loved that she wasn't born into privilege. You know, she made her way. Uh, and uh, again, at a time that it was absolutely impossible for women to think that they could fly. I do feel an affinity. I, I, I refuse to accept boundaries myself. And, and, and I just know, if, uh, and my eyes are definitely focused on, on what I want to do. 52-year-old Naya began pushing boundaries with her early documentaries. Do you feel any shame? Why shame? You leave shame behind when you enter this profession. Her intimate portrayal of Indian strippers certainly shook things up. When I go out at night, sometimes the customer sees me and says, look, there goes that naked dancing girl, that whore. I say, Mat, you enjoyed me on stage and now you say this? That's when I feel shame. And her first feature, Salam Bombay, portrayed the gritty life of India's street kid. It follows 10-year-old runaway Krishna, experiencing love and tragedy while desperately trying to fund his journey back home. You know, a kid who comes on the street is someone who has already traveled a long journey in, while in childhood and yet wants that childhood. <laughs> Uh, but the pain of it, the loneliness of it, and the, the fact that you can never go back to a home that you once knew, that is the loneliness of a street child. And that's what Salam Bombay, you know, both is about and came from. Competing with Bollywood's bouncy dance numbers and happy endings, it failed to find a domestic audience. But it was a huge success internationally, earning an Oscar nomination for Best Foreign Film. Oh, look, there's an accident. Now Hollywood was interested, and the Harvard graduate put rising star Denzel Washington opposite unknown student Sarita Chowdhury. You think I'm trying to hit on you? For a multiracial romance set deep in America's South. Mm. Are you? I am waiting. Naya was evolving her trademark of lush visuals, telling heartbreaking stories of how migration impacts on families. I am like Cuba, used by many, conquered by no one. From the journey of Cuban refugees led by Marissa Tomei. What do you want in America that I can give you here? I love every spreadly. To the tale of Trailer Trash America, led by Uma Thurman. Hey! Oh, hey. Where you been? What? Well, I've been right here. Good for you. Well, thanks. In her masterpiece, Monsoon Wedding. I can't wait around to see if Vikram's wife is ever going to agree to divorce him. I've read too many magazines, Rhea. 
Naya tackles adultery and abuse within India's middle class. It wasn't enough that he touched me when I was a girl. That wasn't enough that you had to teach Alia how older people kiss. It won the top prize at the Venice Film Festival and became America's highest ever grossing Indian film. When Naya finally took on traditional rags to riches costume drama, it wasn't in Bollywood but in Britain with Reese Witherspoon in Vanity Fair. Naya followed this with a return to the cross-cultural beat. Did you guys know all the stuff about him when he decided to name me, that he was paranoid, suicidal, friendless, depressed? You forgot to mention that he was also a genius. A story about a Bengali family in America. I don't understand how you guys could name me after someone so strange. Her latest film, Amelia, retains Naya's trademark theme, how crossing boundaries, emotional and physical, can bring heartbreak and tragedy, but also salvation and freedom. You all right? Your reaction cut the switch. You saved our ass. I don't fly and I don't jump off airplanes with any kind of alacrity, but I, uh, I feel like I can do anything. Roll sound. Everything's rolling. And action. It's such an obsessive task, making a film, that I just wouldn't be able to do that kind of work without really feeling every day that I must do it. You managed to dance in all worlds of filmmaking, documentaries, Hollywood, indie cinema. You do it beautifully. How would you define yourself as a filmmaker? Oh, I don't, you, I leave the definitions to you, but I have a reputation of making big looking films on very little yeah. money. I don't yeah. like that reputation because I want lots of money, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I have this thing, you know. <laughs> You love the preparation. You have to have that preparation. I, I do something very pretentiously called the manifesto, where I write about uh, each scene, whatever comes to my mind, how I visualize it in any way, from costuming to clothing to the light to whatever comes to me, you know, about that scene. And I prepare this manifesto of every scene, and I make this visual binder that I distribute to my main heads of department about two, three months before I shoot. And so by the time we are shooting, everyone knows exactly what they are doing. And that's how we achieve it. I mean, Monsoon Wedding I made consciously in $1 million because I wanted to know after 12 years of making bigger films whether I could be still lean, mean fighting machine, you know, where I could go back yeah. to that. Yeah. And, and then when Sabrina Dhawan, the writer, and I started cooking up the script, we ended up on, a, you know, five major subplots, uh, I don't know, 70, <laughs> 80, 78 speaking parts, a big film actually, yeah, but we had only raised the million bucks and I wanted to do it only in a million. I still watch Monsoon Wedding and I just, it's just euphoria. You know, there are some films you make where there we say in Hindi, there's some jadu in them, some magic in them, and there is something in uh, Monsoon Wedding that is magic. We had no money to process the film, so we were never looking at the film while we were shooting it. But when I got back to New York and looked at the work, it had this energy in it, you know, because everyone was psyched and ready and prepped and they knew we had to go, go, go. And, and go, go without sacrifice. Just being a woman in this industry is difficult, but when you add to that being a woman of color, it's really daunting. But you've been at this for much longer and you are the trailblazer. So what was the experience like for you? How did it get easier? And what advice do you have? It, it started from really being always the outsider. At home in India, I was considered a weird novelty and abroad, I was a complete novelty. <laughs> and uh, so I followed my instinct and I was always very relieved and proud to come from where I came from, even though where I came from, was no, I was not understood at home, you know, but still that was my treasure. And I think this gave me a, a toughness to deal with the endless rejections that are bound to be part and parcel of filmmaking. 
जैसे चिल्लर रूम से भागा जो भी रास्ते में है चिट दिया फटा फटा I started as an actor. I was an actor in Indian uh, political street theater. I came to uh, America on a scholarship uh, to Harvard University, and I stumbled into documentary filmmaking uh, at the college. But I was lucky because my teachers were uh, Ricky Leacock and D. A. Pennybaker, who really essentially had created the cinema verite movement. Uh, the cinema verite meaning the truth of life, about you know a sync sound camera, mobile recorder. Go into people's lives if i want to find out anything i'm not going to read time magazine i'm not going to read newsweek i'm not going to read any of these magazines i mean cuz they just got too much to lose by printing the truth you know that so i made these documentaries for about 7 years you know living with strippers in a bombay nightclub living with street kids living with really in those in the 80s when you don't doctor documentaries you just surrender to the world and you film as you can see and then you create a narrative in the editing room She has spent a mere 2 weeks with her husband and now her life is defined by his absence. I always uh, want to remain a student of life and that is the source of much of my uh, fictional ideas because I still believe that truth is stranger and more powerful than fiction. Whenever I ask him something he gets angry with me. But you have to ask him what's on his mind. You haven't asked? The puchut na thi. I haven't asked. Join us for more of Mira Nair's masterclass that's after the break in part 2. He met her in the fall. Welcome back to this special edition of the Fabulous Picture Show and our masterclass with the wonderful director Mira Nair. Mississippi Masala is a story very close to your heart. Your husband's Ugandan. My husband, I found him during the making of Mississippi Masala. <laughs> And what was your husband doing at the time? He was a professor of politics at Makerere University, the local university in Kampala. So Mississippi Masala helped you find a husband. Yeah. There we go, ladies. <laughs> Single ladies going to filmmaking. Everyone I'm fly to <laughs> Kampala today. <laughs> <laughs> But so it became very close to your heart then. Mississippi Masala actually came out of being a brown person in the middle of black and white at my university at harvard you know it was a very interesting place to be because i was accessible to both black and white communities but there were invisible lines i definitely felt so i was looking for a story that would be about that i know you and your folks can come down here from god knows where and be about as black as the ace of spades and as soon as you get here you start acting white and treating us like we your doormats i know that you and your daughter ain't but a few shades from this right here that i know and what if a uh, ugandan asian girl fell in love with an african american boy uh, and one who had never known india as their home and the uh, the boy never knowing africa as their home and what happens if that would happen you know i'm a mix masala it's masala it's a bunch of hot spices oh, hot and spicy <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned your experience in university, feeling on the periphery of two colors, white and and black, as you say, which is something that is very much in a constant theme in many of your films, always being an outsider. Well, I didn't feel peripheral in university, but it's interesting that I am always inspired by those who are considered outsiders. You know, because I always question who is the person who has the right to make that decision. In our Hindu society, an unmarried girl is of no use. This idea of say respectability was the heart of my earlier documentary India Cabaret. If my life was settled. I too would find a good man, get married, and stay home. Even I think like that. And what does she think? She is in her prison, cooking food every day, looking after her man, her babies. She must think, if I had the freedom, I too would roam the world. When you put the juxtaposition of with, with dancers who long for respectability and the woman who has respectability longing for freedom, you wonder who is the more free. And often, again, these are out, so-called outsiders, but they have such resilience and such uh, wit, and you know, uh, and and no self-pity, which was also the basis of why I fell in love with the street kids in Salam Bombay. <laughs> in Kampala we call it lifeist you know someone who is intoxicated with life and has an appetite for living i really gravitate towards making films about people who have this will to live and live not just 
uh, marginally or you know in a meager way but live with a full heart <laughs> I always believe that when your heart is loosened, then you feel the sorrow even more. <laughs> Can you talk about the difference between making studio films and independent films? The process is very different. My common joke is that I'm a very collaborative person so long as I have the last word, <laughs> which doesn't fully happen in a studio film. And action, Hillary. Have you heard from Lindbergh? What did he say? Well done. <laughs> OK, so yeah, that's good. The dance with the studio that's film, great. and it's really a dance. You have to enjoy the dance. You have to enjoy the rhythm of it, because otherwise you're screwed. It's always a negotiation. In my own films, because I have the good fortune of also producing my films, I have, of course, complete freedom. And I create a financial structure where that freedom is possible to me. Um, another thing I want to tell younger folks who are starting is have the eye and the heart to pick your collaborators and be loyal to them, be devoted to them. And of course, they should not be yes people. They should always take you further. And this is something I've really cultivated is my family, so a film family. I just want to ask, like, how do you make the transitions from making movies in India based on Indian themes with Indian actors to making movies in Hollywood with actors uh, from Hollywood? I don't make a distinction between making so-called Indian movies and so-called Hollywood movies. I make a distinction between the independent and the studio system, so it's not about treating Nasiruddin Shah any different from treating Hilary Swank. The, the actors need a safe environment in which, I like to say, in which we can all make fools of ourselves, in which we can take risks and jump off, you know, things that we've never, tr we have to try things. And it is the director's job to make that happen, to make everyone in your team, Bloom. After September 11, you made a short film which was absolutely beautiful. It was such a compelling story. A young man who was vilified in his death. He was accused of being involved in September 11. Let's talk about him. I am a New Yorker, and it's the most international city in the world in which people who look like all of us here will never feel anything but at home, except after 9-11. After 9-11, people who look like us were the other. There was an amazing compendium uh, called 9-11-01. A French producer asked 11 directors to make nine minutes each on anything, a carte blanche freedom on 9-11. On and again, truth was stranger than fiction, and the newspapers had this constant um, tale of the Hamdani family. Something happened? The papers are accusing Salman of being a terrorist. You know someone such a long time, yet you don't know the first thing about them. What is happening? A woman who taught English for 25 years in a Brooklyn high school uh, who had four sons, and one of her sons didn't come home that day. Now, in one of the files, it says your son is a Pakistani citizen, and in another, it says he's a British citizen? No, he's an American citizen. He was born in Pakistan, but he's an American citizen. And so she went from her son being missing to being called a terrorist, and then when they found his remains, he was declared a hero because he went to help. He was an ambulance medic on the side. Is this the price you pay for raising a compassionate human being? You have honored America by choosing us your final resting place. And I thought that story was really uh, indicative of the rising flames of war talk against the complexity of real people, human beings. Till we meet again. A theater experience really very important before going on screen for the movies. Frankly, I think life experience is the most important because a director must have something to say. The theater for me was a microcosm of that life. And I came as an actor, you know. And that was interesting because you understand the fragility and the power of being an actor, you know, um, and also the training of it. So. That, I think, it's helped me enormously because I'm with the actors. I'm in solidarity with them. I know not to just yell at them and say, just do it better. <laughs> to elicit your views on censorship, whether you are for it, against it. Um, I think the way that censorship 
has been conducted in India is a very archaic method. It is completely subjective and you're entirely at the mercy of whoever the committee may be. Uh, look at what happened in India with the fact in the earlier days when kissing, when lovemaking, things like that, that the whole world does, and certainly in India we do because our population is, you know, going crazy, <laughs> uh, uh, is, uh, you know, it's like old as the hill. So, but that was not allowed on film. So we, what did we do? We made songs with 1800 thrusts of the most vulgar order. What is that? That is just a twisted way of getting past the censorship. One thing I wanted to share when I made Kama Sutra, which was obviously and consciously, uh, amongst other things, an erotic film, uh, I insisted with the Indian distributor that we have women-only screenings. So Tuesdays was devoted to women only. Then women didn't feel like they were coming to see a film that had, you know, was tricky in front of men, you know? And it, it became, and the movie is so much about female solidarity, that, th that the screenings themselves became about female solidarity and great humor and, 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 and freedom, actually. Since when is woman simply a helpless animal? Just like men, we are awake and filled with longing. But no buts. You've often had incredibly inspiring women. You, you seem to have a tendency for matriarchs. But let's talk about Amelia Earhart specifically. What was it that, that appealed to you most about this woman? The first thing that got me was the 16 hours of newsreel of the real Amelia Earhart. Another national heroine, Amelia Earhart Putnam. And even though she was an icon in her lifetime and really famous, there was an um, odd and consistent sense of humility in her that really captured me. <laughs> bravery and the kind of crazy adrenaline that she got from the thrill of it. And she would make no bones about that. That was the other thing I loved. Uh, I fly for the fun of it, she would say. I want to do it because I want to do it. You know, she didn't make big, grandiose statements. And then I got involved. I said yes. And when you say yes, you're riding the tiger. She's a warrior and she's certainly an inspirer. Can we please thank Mira Naya here? <laughs> thank you so much. Excuse me, sir. Where am I? Uh, in Gallagher's pasture. Where are you supposed to be? When I left, I was aiming for Paris. Oh, you missed, you know. It's over there. <laughs> Well, we hope you enjoyed this special edition of the Fabulous Picture Show, and we hope you were inspired by the talent and generosity of Mira Nair and her masterclass. Thank you, Mira, and thank you for watching. See you next time.